And, uh, and uh, coming to tonight's program, uh, Catherine Blish is uh, Associate Professor of Medicine and uh, <clears throat> Immunology at Stanford School of Medicine. Um, and her clinical focus is on infectious diseases. And this is the shortest introduction you ever got, uh, you ever got uh, Catherine. Uh, she, she was kind enough uh, to give us an evening uh, in June 2020. Um, of course, at the, at the time, not much was known about this new uh, disease. And so I invited her to have another fireside chat, casual chat, uh, to see how much we learned. And uh, I, I, I warned the audience that one year in science is not a long time. <clears throat> it's still a very young disease. It's very is still a, a very new virus. So we still, I, I doubt we have definitive answers about uh, much. Again, if you want, I mean, if you registered for this Zoom, you saw the page with the, <clears throat> with the long uh, bio. So anything you want to know about Professor Blish, uh, go back to the page with the regist where you registered and there should be also be a, <clears throat> a link to her webpage at Stanford. <clears throat> so Catherine, thank you very much for doing this. Oh, it's my pleasure. Um, I would like to start just to make sure that everybody is on the same page. I would like to start, if you can, with a very brief uh, summary of how the immune system uh, works, just to make sure we are on the same page. Uh, T cells, B cells, antibody. How, how, first of all, when I, whenever I read about all the pathogens that infectious ones that attack us, I I'm amazed that we survive. I mean, as bacteria, viruses, fungi, parasites, and we have this wonderful thing called the immune system that somehow works. Uh, most of the time, we don't even know what that, that, that is working. Yeah, so obviously that's a big question and I could you know, take several hours to, uh, to go through this, but I'll, I'll just try and hit some of the highlights. And, and first of all, it's, it's funny that you you preface that way because I think in med school, they always teach, um, my theory is they always teach microbiology in the same quarter as immunology generally. And I think it's because honestly, med students, I can say this as a physician, um, can be a little bit maybe um, worried about their own diseases. And um, so at least you're learning about all the exotic bugs at the same time you're learning about how you fight them. Um, but anyway, so the, um, the immune system broadly is broken into several categories. And the first sort of big way I'm gonna split it is by what's called the innate immune system compared to the adaptive immune system. And the innate immune system, it's referred to as innate because of the idea that it doesn't, it's sort of the dumb arm, it's generally there and it recognizes general features associated with the pathogens that can attack us. And, and I should, actually even step back and define pathogen. Um, you know, there are tons of bacteria, viruses, fungi, as you refer to, um, many of which we live with in harmony, but when they become disease causing, we refer to them as a pathogen, um, pathology being the Latin for disease. Um, so to become a pathogen by definition, it's figured out a way to get around our immune system um, and that's what we do. But the way the innate immune system works, it's, it's a series of proteins, chemicals, and cells that generally protect us. And so in this, you have things like the acid in your stomach. You can consider um, part of the innate immune system because most bacteria can't live at a pH of two, which is what your stomach's at. Um, but more importantly, your, your skin is a barrier and there are proteins that are secreted by immune cells called defensins that it can inactivate viruses or bacteria, but there's also cells, um, and particularly what are referred to as phagocytic cells, eating cells. So these are cells like your neutrophils, your monocytes, your macrophages, that literally go around and eat stuff that looks foreign and try and inactivate it that way. And in general, what they'll recognize is a pattern associated with an infection. So for instance, the types of sugars that a bacteria make are different from the types of sugars that our cells make. And so these cells might have receptors for those kinds of sugars. And, and that sends essentially a danger signal that it recognizes and knows it should munch on that as opposed to one of our own healthy cells. 
So that's the innate immune system. And there are lots of different cells and lots of different ideas um, around it. And then we have the adaptive immune system. And this is the smart arm of the immune system and what has memory. And the idea is that the adaptive immune system roughly has two arms, the B cells and the T cells. And the B cells make antibodies. And this becomes really important because antibodies are proteins that float around with us. I think everyone's now heard of antibodies in the era of COVID. It's a large way that vaccines work because some of these antibodies can be what are referred to as neutralizing antibodies, meaning they can bind to a virus and prevent it from even entering a cell. So if I get vaccinated and my B cells get programmed to make COVID antibodies, I've got these COVID antibodies floating around in my bloodstream. And if I get it exposed to COVID, those antibodies might bind to and then activate the virus before it even has a chance to enter a cell. Boom, it's done. Now, the B cells only know how to do that because the T cells were talking to them. <laughs> so you can't make a good memory response without the T cells coordinating events. And the T cells also have this ability to have what's called, referred to as memory. And for an immunologist, what memory means is the ability to respond better and faster the second time you see something. So roughly, you have your CD4 T cells, one subset of T cells, that they are the orchestra conductors. They tell the B cells what to do. The B cells make antibodies. But you have another type of T cell called a CD8 T cell, and those are killers. And so let's say... I got exposed to 100 virus particles, and 99 of them were inactivated by the virus, by antibodies, but one of them got into a cell. I now need to deal with an infected cell in order to stop the infection from spreading. And the way that might work is a CD8 T cell can come along and recognize that cell's infected and kill it. And the T cells recognize, and B cells recognize very differently from those innate immune cells. They recognize little pieces of the foreign object, whether it's a bacteria or virus, and remember and respond to exactly that little tiny sequence or piece. So it's, it's very smart and coordinated. The way they know how to do that is actually the innate immune system told them what to do. Um, so it's, I presented it as two arms, but they're really quite intermixed. And one really exciting area of science right now is that these innate cells aren't as dumb as we thought they were. They can um, remember things too, and we're only beginning to understand that. So I know that was a lot, um, but hopefully helpful and appropriate. Oh, very, uh, very helpful, and also, <clears throat> and also, you made me realize that the immune system is not there just to protect us, but to provide the long-lasting protection. You talked about memory, so it's not like I, 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 I kick out these uh, these pathogens now, but it's also designed to remember that and to provide that protection, ideally for their whole life, right? Exactly. Okay. In fact, you know, with yellow fever vaccine, we, we've seen that people can remember yellow fever for upwards of 80 years. It's crazy. Okay. Okay, we'll get to the current vaccines um, later. Let's, uh, <clears throat> okay, now that we are, um, let's talk about COVID one year later. So first of all, <clears throat> Uh, well, the general question would be, what have we learned in this year? But it's probably a long, uh, a long answer. Let's uh, let's be specific. Did we finally determine that COVID is uh, airborne? Yes, I think it. We did determine that it is airborne, but I think most of us still believe the vast majority of transmission is probably still droplet, but it is, there is too much evidence that it can be airborne to ignore. And clearly that can account for many of the transmission events, particularly when you see like some of the plane studies where people, you know, 12 rows up were infected. Hmm. It's gonna have so to be airborne. How does that change our strategy? I assume it doesn't change anything when it comes to masks. We can just regret we didn't start wearing masks earlier. Um, other than that? Well, to be honest, um, I mean, I, I can't remember if we talked too much about masks in the early days, early on, but it, it, it 
depending on how much of transmission is airborne versus droplet, it actually does change the masking strategies. Because for a true airborne pathogen like tuberculosis, um, the regular masks we're all wearing, um, you know, a surgical mask, I happen to have one here, um, don't aren't adequate to stop an airborne um, bacteria because you know there's little leaks right here and right here. Um, you need a well-sealed N95, a full respirator to truly prevent airborne transmission. Um, and the reality is you need to be fitted for those. It's, it's a complicated thing. Um, the best sealing mask you can have is the best mask you can have. But the, the good news is airborne transmissions appear to be relatively rare and any masking is better than no masking. <laughs> but it's not going to be 100% effective to prevent airborne, which is why in healthcare settings, we do wear a full N95 that will filter out. I mean, they're called 95s because they filter out 95% of airborne particles down to a very small size. But you suspect that there's still a lot of transmission happens through dr droplets. Yeah, I mean, a droplet just has a lot more virus particles per droplet. Um, and, um, and that's a part of it. And also the moisture, you know, viruses don't love being dried out on surfaces. Um, they become inactive very quickly. That's why it's, um, and so, you know, the advantage of the droplet for a virus particle is it's in this nice moist environment where it, it doesn't risk dying or losing its efficacy. Um, and just to sort of clarify this, I, I like to think of transmission as an issue of um, the analogy I'm liking to use right now is, is a soccer game. Um, and maybe just because I like soccer or football, depending on where you're from, but it's, it's a low scoring game um, in general. Uh, you know, you'll see, you'll see a match where a team will take 20 shots on goal and they'll win maybe one nil. Um, Virus transmission is not unlike that. At any given time, if I'm in a room with an infected person, and even if I'm infected, I might be spewing particles. But the chance that any one of those particles is going to find the right cell in the right spot is not very good. Um, so what we're doing with a mask is we're massively decreasing the number of shots on goal for ourselves and for the next person, because the vast majority of those viruses are getting caught in your mask or the next person's mask. And you're just really changing the curve from something that's unlikely anyway to make it vanishingly unlikely. So that's why even an inferior mask is fabulously protective. Yeah, so I have to say that now we, we don't shake hands anymore, right? Most people don't even hug anymore. We're extremely careful what, what we touch. We, we don't touch surfaces that are touched by a lot of people. I even, I even see people correctly uh, using a piece of paper when they grab the, uh, the thing at the gas station to, to pump gas, you know, um, which makes sense, right? I mean, it's been touched by a lot of people. So given that we, we are now, I think, more or less naturally taking all these precautions, how do we still get infected from uh, uh, droplets? Well, to be clear, um, droplets and surface are different. Um, most droplet transmissions occur because you breathe the droplet that the other person coughed out. So maybe, maybe I should clarify. I think there's, I think we're having a definition issue here. So airborne, uh, the only difference between to, to a transmission expert and ID doc, the only difference between airborne and droplet transmission is the size of the particle, actually. So airborne transmission refers to very, very, very minuscule droplet sizes that can stay suspended in the air for extended periods of time, like minutes to hours to days. Whereas droplets can only su stay suspended in the, in the air for minutes at most because they're heavy and they sink to the floor. There is almost no data to support surface transmission of COVID. Like the whole bit, like, I think it's great that we're not shaking hands and we're not doing that, um, mostly because I don't wanna shake the hand of somebody who's touched their face or their mouth or their eyes, right? With, um, 
because then I could get it. Um, but on surfaces, there isn't actually that much virus. The real risk is breathing that droplet directly in and having it land in your respiratory tract while it's still moist, while it's still suspended. Uh -huh. um, so it's, it's really just honestly a, a weight issue. <laughs> Uh -huh. Mass, really, technically. Very good. Um, next, <clears throat> do we know more about why some people, why people respond differently to the virus? When, why some people are completely asymptomatic, other people get very sick, uh, other people get long COVID, and uh, children are mostly asymptomatic. Do we have any idea why this is happening? I mean, <laughs> Honestly, the short answer is, is in large part no, um, uh, but there's a lot of nuance there, of course. And in fact, that's actually one of the major areas of investigation in my own lab, where we're trying to dissect out exactly that by looking at people who have asymptomatic, mild, moderate, severe disease, and now looking at long COVID and looking at people with breakthroughs and profiling all of those to try to understand what the differences are. And you know, the short story is we're still trying to elucidate it, um, but we definitely are seeing some hints from our work and many others. I mean, there are a few things we know about already. Um, older individuals tend to mount less robust immune responses, particularly their T cell responses, and that probably is not a good thing. Um, we're seeing, um, there have been controversial reports about men versus women and the quality of the immune response, And although it's clear that hospitalization rates are higher among men, um, but the underlying reasons we don't fully understand. Um, there's obviously, if people are immunosuppressed, they're more likely to acquire the disease. Interestingly enough, there's also controversy about how much, how much worse they fare with the disease um, because much of the disease pathogenesis is actually a hyperactive inflammatory response after a certain point. Um, so we have hints, but we don't really know. Um, and certainly, and this is the challenge where it's gonna take more time. Um, a lot of our data points to the fact that um, one of these innate immune cells, well, there, there are two of these innate immune cells that are playing a critical role, role in COVID-19. Um, one are the neutrophils. They're the, the, the shortest living, among the shortest living of our blood cells. They're normally responding to bacterial infection, and they're absolutely hyperinflamed in the setting of COVID. And that's probably not ideal because they're really better suited, honestly, to respond to a bacterial infection than a viral infection, to put it very simply. And so we're trying to understand why they're so hyperactivated and are there ways we can turn them down? But also what we don't understand is why some people have these hyperactive neutrophils and some people don't, and that we're still elucidating. And Conversely, on the other side, the other innate immune cell monocytes, which we normally think of as good for viruses, at least in the peripheral blood, have lost their ability to function and are actively immunosuppressive. Um, but with all these studies, we get into a chicken and an egg phenomenon. These are people who are already sick who I'm profiling. Um, so, you know, I don't know, are they that way because of that cellular dysfunction or is that cellular dysfunction because something happened earlier? And so what we're doing, which takes longer, is we're building better model systems in our biosafety level three lab where we can control the infection time, manipulate the cells and try and see what's the chicken and what's the egg, which ones are actually causing the disease versus which ones are the result of the disease. And this will help us develop better therapeutics. But there's something very critical about who gets hyperinflammatory and when they get there that we're getting close to understanding and we're not quite there. Hmm. Um, let me open a parenthesis. You, you mentioned data. I mean, at this point, with uh, how, many, how many million people infected in the world, uh, you should have, a, I mean, in general, the scientific community should have millions and millions and millions of data 
you guys share data? I mean, do, do labs share data? It's, it's highly variable, to be honest. Um, uh, we, uh, we, meaning my lab, we share data. Um, and we share data broadly and freely. And in fact, um, we, uh, we published the first data set that we shared with the world on the single cell profiling that we're doing to try and understand which cells are the bad players and which cells are the good cell um good players um and we actually released our data publicly on august 26 of 2020 um and i i'm sorry did i say august i meant april and i, I say that date um because to give you an idea um i what i hope is one of the best things that comes from covid is a new era of data sharing i think everyone recognized that we needed to pitch in together to help each other out and you know worrying about who was going to get their nature paper this was not the time um i mean some labs still withhold but other labs do not but we started collecting samples on patients on uh i think it was march 17th and on march 21st i asked my team do you think you could do this profiling that we do where we look at each individual cell and every transcript it expresses which is a fairly intense thing to do on the fly, meaning as the samples are coming in. And um, so we actually published that data set 26 days after collecting the first sample. Um, and well before we had a paper accepted, but at the time we thought it's a ton of data, you know, it's a terabyte of data roughly. It's a lot for us to analyze and a lot for the world to analyze. And we felt like by releasing it, it would generate new hypotheses and allow other groups to explore things that my you know, group, as much as we're growing, there are only so many hypotheses we can follow with my group. And, and it worked out well. For instance, a German group following up on a quirk that we did, normally people freeze the cells and then thaw them and analyze them later. And it turns out a really interesting cell type doesn't actually survive that. And we only made our discovery because we were in a hurry and we didn't freeze them and batch them like we normally would have. And so, the German group elected to do the same thing, and they basically did a study 10 times bigger than our study and confirmed some of our critical findings and then took them a step further, um, which then we saw that and took it a step further and explored a potential therapeutic offer uh, opportunity. So that kind of cycle forward has been really rewarding huh. of publishing our data. That's, that's encouraging. Um, so back back to the data. Uh, do we have data about uh, who is more likely to transmit the virus? Are asymptomatic people as likely as symptomatic ones? Are children as likely as adults? We, do we have data that sort of tell us the distribution there? So it's it's hard to get precise data because um, particularly if, when it comes to the asymptomatic transmission, a lot of assumptions go into every model about what the testing rates are, what the real rates. So you have to take it all with a little bit of grain of salt that the confidence intervals around all these estimates are, are quite broad. Um, but with that in mind, um, I think what we can say is that asymptomatic people can spread because we've seen cases, but it is, what is not widely agreed upon is the extent to which they're sort of the hidden driver of the pandemic. Um, there's one study out of University of Chicago, I think it was, that claimed that like 50% of infections or something were driven by asymptomatic people. Most other modeling studies put it at more like 10 to 15%. Um, you know, the, the reality is it's somewhere between 10 and 50%. Um, my instinct would favor the more modest uh, of these estimates for a variety of reasons. Um, for somebody to transmit, and I'll get to the kids, they have to have a lot of virus in their upper respiratory tract so they can cough, sneeze, talk it out. And in general, people who are asymptomatic from what we know tend to have those really high viral loads that give them lots of shots on goal when they cough for the virus um, for shorter periods of time. So there's a narrower window in theory. 
Um, children. Um, children can transmit, uh, but it does appear to be, again, really broad estimates, somewhat lower rates than adults. Um, you know, one study that looked at outbreak investigations, they like, it was early in the pandemic and this will be changing, but I think they, I think they traced 213 sort of mini outbreaks. And of those 213, only eight had a child as the primary, the, the, the first person who then led to the broader outbreak. So that's lower, but you know, since then we've seen things like these horrendous camp outbreaks in, um, most recently, there was an MMWR report just published on October 1st, tracing um, Louisiana's camp outbreaks. And I think, I mean, it was like something like 230 outbreaks associated with both day and overnight camps among largely children in Louisiana, where admittedly they weren't mandating masking, they weren't taking the regular public health measures, but kids can transmit, they can get infected. So I, I probably have totally lost track of the question. What was I supposed to answer? Was that it? If it's more likely, less likely, what's the distribution of? Yeah, I think slightly less likely, but um, but also that's like changing now, depending on where you are. Until we get children vaccines, um, you know, here in the Bay Area, where eighty eight percent of our population in Santa Clara County have received of twelve and up have received the vaccine, a lot of our transmissions are coming from those 12 and under. Of course. <clears throat> um, is, there a, is there any evidence that the virus can remain dormant in, a, in the host cell? Uh, is, there, is there any concern that it could be dormant in some individuals and come back? Uh, I mean, viruses can remain dormant for a long time, right, in some cases. Absolutely. Um, so it's a slightly complicated question. So I'm going to break it down. There's there's various kinds of dormancy. Um, you know, one kind of dormancy are, for instance, the retroviruses like HIV, which is sort of where I got my start as a virologist, where HIV actually integrates itself into our DNA. And when it gets into a cell and it does that, it's with that cell for the length of that cell's life. And if that cell divides, its progeny have this hidden HIV that as soon as you withdraw HIV drugs, it's back in full force. Um, but that is a characteristic only of retroviruses. There's absolutely zero evidence that SARS-CoV-2, uh, the virus that causes COVID, um, can integrate or cause permanent changes. But you're right, dormancy is a different issue. We, we know, for instance, in Ebola, that there are certain sanctuary sites where the virus can kind of hang out and hide from the immune system in the eye and actually in the testes. And interestingly enough, immunologically, those are what are referred to as immune privilege sites where because of the risk of inflammation, um, the immune system is generally kept out, like T cells aren't generally allowed in. Um, so that's potentially how the virus can kind of hide out there. Um, with COVID, um, again, on a cellular basis, it's not gonna integrate, it's not doing that. I, there was a study which is generally not, um, not believed in the field, but by a good group claiming that it integrates. I. I I'm unconvinced by their data, honestly. Um, but what I have seen evidence of is perhaps that the virus is hanging out in sites and continuing to replicate at some low level that could potentially cause disease. So there've been a few reports of um, shedding of the virus from the stool for an extended period of time. I should be clear, it's not live virus, it's just viral RNA, nobody's ever been able to identify like actual virus coming out of poop. So I don't think that's like a concern for transmission. Um, uh, we have some data that we're going to try and submit to a journal next week showing that fat tissue can harbor coronavirus. We don't know how long it hangs out. Um, 
So it, it could. Um, and the reality is the only way we're going to know this is have time. Um, but it does seem like, you know, we've seen this time and time again, where we're, we, I think as virologists, we need to not try to reassure people when we don't, when there is uncertainty. You know, once upon a time, I would have said, absolutely not. It's not a retrovirus, it's gone. But then you see this residual staining of the virus protein in the gut a couple months later, and I have no reasonable explanation for that. Okay. <clears throat> now you mentioned uh, vaccinations. Uh, in the Bay Area, we have a very high rate of vaccination. Plus, uh, some people did get COVID. So total, we have probably uh, almost 90% population. Uh, uh, we reach a level of new immunity around 90%. What's in your opinion? What's the sufficient level of immunity to uh, dramatically reduce uh, transmission? Period. Not only hospitalization, just transmissions. I mean, if we if the Bay Area is almost at 90%, how much more you want? Um, well, I think the Bay Area at 90% is spectacular, and you know. It's in, it's, it sounds like we should be able to say a number, you know, early in the pandemic, um, when we still had the Wuhan strain, um, the estimates were that 80% would be about the level required for so-called herd immunity, which would be enough people immune that you would stop forward transmission and drop the number that, again, more people know about the R naught, meaning if I'm infected, how many new cases will I drive? If the R0 is two, if I get infected, I'll infect two more people and the virus will continue to spread. Once you drop R0 below one, it's an abortive infection. Um, so the problem is that we're not dealing with the Wuhan strain, we're dealing with Delta, which is probably at least twofold more infectious, if not more. Um, and uh, so, our, so the percent required for herd immunity ends up going up closer to 90, 95%. Um, you know, honestly, if you just look at the numbers, the 90%, we're probably there. But the catch is it's a local phenomenon. Our 90% is a population average. And, and the reality is if you go on Stanford campus, it's 100%. But there are pockets where if that rate is 70%, those pockets locally are still capable of driving transmission. And then those can cause spillover into the, pop, into the vaccinated population because we, we know that breakthroughs will happen and, as, and breakthroughs will account for a greater majority of cases, the more people are vaccinated just because that's, that's um, you know, a thing, right? If everyone's vaccinated, all infections are gonna be breakthroughs. Uh, do we have uh, solid data about how long immunity lasts uh, after infection and after vaccination? Solid might be an exaggeration at this point, um, but, and I'm realizing I probably should have turned on a light in here, anticipating that it was going to get dark, but um, uh, so what can we say? What we can say is that based on the Israeli data, which has been widely used to promote boosters, but I'm not sure supports it, where they got Pfizer out early, that um, if you actually look at the data by controlling appropriately for the vaccinated versus unvaccinated population, the, the Pfizer vaccine was 82% effective at presenting hospitalization for those over 50 and 92% for those over under 50, and that was approximately eight months after they gave it. So that's pretty darn good. It's, I would classify it as spectacular, in fact. Um, you know, what we know is that we can certainly get good protection six to nine months after vaccination. The question is, what is our target? Is our target preventing hospitalizations or is our target preventing infections? You know, anyone who's reading the newspaper knows that we're starting to see slipping, particularly with how incredibly transmissible Delta is in, um, in our protection from infections. But what we're not seeing is a lot of slippage in the prevention of hospitalizations. And one could argue that is a more important goal, at least in the short term. Um, natural infection actually appears to be slightly less good for this disease than 
the vaccines. Um, and um, at least based on the Brazil experience, um, in particular, where they saw a lot of breakthroughs, um, some of that was a new variant and some of that was waning immunity, but likely decent protection for at least six months. The good news is people who had COVID and then get vaccinated have just killer responses and are really, really, really protected. Mm. So, and I can... um, uh, talking about data, um, <clears throat> why, <clears throat> why don't we test antibodies in everybody who gets vaccinated? I, I was vaccinated in, uh, in January, you probably even earlier, given you are in the field, um, especially at the beginning, I was surprised nobody was testing my antibodies. I have no idea if I had 50%, 60%, 90%. You know, some of it was just resource and cost, right? I mean, we've had such a nightmare. I'm just going to turn on a light while I talk. Sure. Um, with getting enough testing capacity that then adding antibody testing to that seemed, I think, like... Uh, a challenge. Um, uh, some of it is, <laughs> yeah, there's no good reason. I mean, one could argue we should have done it and Israel thought it, and you, you know, we're really relying on Israel and the UK to generate this data for us. And then they haven't. Um, there's, one could argue there's no good data reason, but the other argument, just to put up the counterpoint, is that we know that more than 90% of people get really, really ridiculously awesome antibody responses to the vaccine. And so there's actually no reason to test because we know virtually everyone responds. Also, ironically, you know, we're giving boosters now, but we know boosters increase the antibody levels, but what we don't know is do they increase protection? Like nobody's actually done the endpoint analysis, right? We haven't had time. We're giving them because probably they help, but but we don't know. So the, the sad part about not collecting this data is I would argue we shouldn't have collected it at 28 days later because that's what the vaccine trials did and the responses were ridiculously good, better than we've ever seen before. Turns out this is just the easiest virus to make a vaccine to ever, combined with the fact that the mRNA vaccines are ridiculously good at mounting good immune responses when you do them as a two-dose regimen. So, but like, you know, even the J&J &J and AstraZeneca are really good vaccines. They're just not quite as ridiculous as the mRNA. Um, so, you know, there was kind of in a way no reason to test early because we knew everyone was universally great. What's, what we need to be doing, I would argue, is testing now as immunity is waning, because what we need to know is, is there a cutoff where breakthrough infections start to occur? And we need to do that prospectively. Um, but it's really, really expensive. I see. So and cost is an issue. I think just nobody's been willing to enroll because to do that study, you basically need to enroll a cohort of thousands and thousands and test antibody levels and hope that enough people get infected that you can find the cutoff what the where that association was and some of those studies have been done but we don't still know what a protective level of antibody is for covid like you know for flu we know what a certain titer means because we have dozens of years of experience but we don't have that for covid yet um would you say there is consensus now that this is endemic yeah, I think. Okay. One year ago, did you expect this to become endemic? You know, I was, that's a tough question. I think, I mean, I'm kind of a pessimist. So I think probably, probably yes. I mean, I think it's just different personalities. My theory is always prepare for the worst and hope for a pleasant surprise. Um, and, um, you know, once it started, spreading so far and it was clear that our ability to do a worldwide distribution of vaccines was lagging, uh, I was concerned that it would become endemic. Um, you know, very early on, you know, back January, February, March, I was hoping it would be like the original SARS or MERS where we were able to control it with public health measures. But you know, by even by April, May, it was becoming clear that the the genie was out of the bottle. 
And uh, yeah, that, that's an interesting question. What was different with uh, with SARS? I mean, SARS uh, one day just disappeared, and uh, <clears throat> in retrospect, compared with this one, it killed very few people. Yeah. Um, so I think the consensus is that s individuals with SARS only spread the virus when they were very, very sick. So they were febrile and coughing <laughs> a lot. And in general, so with most viruses, there's what's referred to as the eclipse phase, which is that phase before symptoms where the virus level is going up. And I think the difference is that SARS-CoV-2 is spreading during that eclipse phase. So, you know, we, we talked earlier about how many asymptomatic people spread, spread, and that number is probably the minority of total infections. But that's when I talked about that as a minority, I meant the number, the minority who stay asymptomatic the whole time. Um, whether if, if I develop symptoms today, but I was giving a lecture yesterday before I developed symptoms, I could have spread it to 24 people. Um, and that's the difference with, so that's why it was so easy to contain SARS. Mm -hmm. So SARS was deadlier actually, right? It was deadlier. Much deadlier. Much yes. deadlier but actually didn't spread as easily. That's, that was, that's the key difference. Exactly. It wasn't nearly as transmissible, both in terms of the timing of symptoms and actually the virus particle itself was just not as, mm -hmm. as efficient. And can I add that COVID also mutates more easily? I mean, SARS, as far as we know, I mean, when there was SARS, we didn't talk about all these strains and the variants and so on. All RNA viruses, 100% of RNA viruses mutate. Well, all viruses mutate, actually, period. Like, we mutate too, um, just very, very slowly because we only reproduce every for a very long time. Um, everything mutates. RNA viruses mutate faster than any other viruses um, because of the way they replicate themselves. Um, the reason we didn't talk about SARS variants is because we controlled it before it had the chance to develop variants. Mm -hmm. um, the reason we're talking about COVID variants is we let it go hog wild in hundreds of millions of people, each one of which presented it with a new opportunity to develop a new variant. And if you make that many variants, you're going to, by chance, make a variant that's got some really great properties that's going to win the battle. And right now that's Delta and Delta is doing a really fabulous job of replacing everyone else by being the best. I hear you, but this, but this virus seems to be incredibly good at winning the lottery. When a, when a virus or any organism mutates, the, the odds are against the mutation. And, and this one went, went from one strain to another one, to another one, to Delta. And it, seems, it seems so good at uh, yeah, but I mean, the issue is you're only seeing the ones that were successful. I mean, you know, having grown up as an HIV virologist, I mean, HIV's mutation rate is much higher than that of, of COVID, uh, much, much higher. And uh, because it's really sloppy in the way it replicates. So HIV has only a 10 kilo base um, genome and makes on average at least one mutation with every replication and the viral loads on the order of 10 to the seventh particle. So you've basically got every potential mutation in the blood of somebody untreated. So like, this is the virus I grew up with, right? It's evil, it's deadly, it makes every possible mutation. Uh, coronaviruses have a much bigger, clunkier genome. As a result, they can tolerate a lot less mutation. Um, and the way they replicate is different. Um, but um, I, I think it's just purely a numbers game. All RNA viruses are sloppy and you're right. Um, every, uh, most, there's probably been, uh, you know, a hundred million, if not a billion COVID variants that we haven't seen because somebody coughed them out and they never went anywhere. Um, but, you know, the spread of this virus to so many millions upon millions of people so quickly really just provided it with an unfettered landscape to explore every potential mutational space.
And so by chance, you were always going to select for a good variant. Um, in a weird sort of way, and you know, I would love to get together with a modeler and model this at some point. I do kind of wonder if Delta did us a favor in terms of our vaccine strategy, because Delta is not a particularly good escape from our immune response um, variant. Like Alpha that came first, um, it's you know a little bit less susceptible to the antibodies from natural infection or from vaccination, but not, not enough to worry about. The, the variant that scared me very early on was the beta variant, um, the one that was uh, first described in South Africa. Um, that one has some mutations and some of the other and the P1 variant, the gamma, um, first described in Brazil. Those have some escape properties that could have really put a wrench in our vaccine rollouts. Um, and Delta has utterly replaced beta, in, even in South Africa. Um, and so now if we can just get the vaccines to South Africa, we have a chance to really stamp it out. Now that's a big if, there's huge issues there. Interesting, I have no idea, interesting. Um, long COVID, and now this expression, expression has become popular, <clears throat> but I haven't found a, a definition. Is long COVID, uh, a disease or just a, a, a group of symptoms that, that we don't know how to better describe and we just call the long COVID? Yeah, um, it's funny. Um, I was having this very debate with my statistician and my fellow yesterday, which was how do we define it? So um, we call it long COVID. It's also, I think the NIH is moving to the terms post-acute sequelae of COVID, PASC, P-A-S-C. Um, and at this point, there isn't a formal definition, um, which is part of the problem. <laughs> um, so it, at this point, probably it's best to refer to it as a constellation of symptoms in people who had confirmed COVID or at least think they had COVID at some point in the past. And I think like many of these somewhat vague um, symptom-driven diseases, um, it's undoubtedly heterogeneous, meaning it, it could be that part of the problem with defining it is that it might actually be three different diseases, which we're kind of lumping into one group and it's hard, and there's a Zen diagram uh, with some overlapping between them. You know, some people complain of really prominent fatigue and memory deficits and neurologic issues and other people complain they're short of breath even though their chest x-ray and their lung function tests look normal and other people do have um, pulmonary fibrosis where their lungs are actually scarred and you know lumping the person with pulmonary fibrosis with the person who's short of breath with normal appearing lungs with the person who's having memory deficits that's not all the same thing. Um, so the NIH is doing a, a huge push to actually describe it. Um, and so Stanford's one of many sites involved in these studies where we're honestly just trying to collect the data now so we can characterize it and collect samples so then we can get to the mechanistic work. What's driving it? You know, is, is there something different driving the pulmonary fibrosis versus the neurologic deficits. Oh. <clears throat> okay, coming to vaccines. Uh, you mentioned briefly, this was a great virus to make a vaccine. Uh, my question uh, was maybe related to this statement. Why the previous vaccines took a minimum of four years, I believe. And this one, we were able to get, uh, what, three vaccines in one year without counting the Chinese, the Russian, if we count those six vaccines, seven vaccines? Yeah, more than that, because you could count AstraZeneca too, which we never fully approved here. Um, so uh, a lot of reasons. Um, one is that most of the companies had already started and attempted to build vaccines for SARS and MERS, which then went away before there was need for a vaccine. Um, so that's 13 years in the making. Um, 
The other reason is I referred to HIV earlier in this swarm that's in people. Um, for 40 years, we've been trying without success to make an HIV vaccine. And it really stinks that we don't have one, but what has come from that lack of success has been an incredible focus on developing newer and better vaccine platforms. Um, and out of that work, many, the adenovirus platforms that are the basis for Johnson & Johnson and the AstraZeneca, as well as the mRNA vaccines are sort of natural outreaches from those effects, not just in HIV and vaccines in general, but a lot driven by HIV to develop better vaccine platforms. And so, you know, I think there's a lot of, oh, it was in a year, but the reality is, you know, they've got 10 years of safety work on the mRNA vaccines. They've been in phase one trials for 10 years, the problem has been that, um, well, I mean, some could be a business decision. They've been trying to do them as single dose and they're not as good as single dose. So they hadn't been quite good enough to displace, for instance, the hepatitis B vaccines that are already on the market. Like the one shot um, wasn't quite good enough to disrupt a market that already existed. Um, and you know other complicated reasons. But the adenovirus vaccines also have been in clinical trials for 10 years. So the backbones behind these had 10 years of safety data. Um, the only difference was they basically chopped out the HIV, the hepatitis, the cancer, the whatever they were exploring these with and put in the Wuhan envelope um, into an already proven safe platform with 10 years of safety data. Um, and then the FDA did offer an expedited, normally they'd required four years of safety data and they moved that to one year of safety data or in some cases, six months. Um, but again, I think they only felt comfortable making that decision because of 10 years of phase one and two trials with everything except the insert <laughs> done. Um, <clears throat> is it fair to say that this is uh, the these are the vaccines, COVID vaccines of first generation, and uh, eventually we'll have a second generation that is better. Well, better, maybe you not yes, different. And I want to know in which way better. Yeah. So, to be honest, I mean the the mRNA vaccines for COVID are the most effective vaccines for respiratory pathogen the world has ever seen. Um, period. Um, they were never intended or expected to stop transmission. We don't give the flu vaccine to stop transmission. We give the flu vaccine to keep people out of the hospital. Um, these vaccines are astoundingly good at keeping people out of the hospital, but the nose is and the mouth are tough things to sterilize, meaning to you know prevent any infection. What, what we were hoping they would do was prevent the infection from going into the lungs and causing pneumonia and making people sick. And they, I mean, they can't get better than 98%, I don't think, you know, in the early phases. Like, it's just not, not a thing. Now, we might have gotten fooled and then Delta kind of kicked us in the butt because they were so good, they actually seemed to prevent transmission. And then I think we all got a little lax and whipped off our masks and caused a resurgence. Um, and then a better virus came along and, and we were sad. <laughs> basically. Um, so they won't be better at preventing hospitalization because I think the bar is now like set at, at a maximal level. Um, could we get better at sterilizing the nose and preventing forward transmission even with Delta? It's possible um, that we could find a, a, a vaccine that will lead to better mucosal immunity, better antibodies right in the nose and mouth. Um, and then the variant issue, which we sort of alluded to earlier. I mean, as long as we're getting millions of infections, there's going to be new variants. And if a variant came along that had the transmissibility of Delta, but the escape ability of Beta, that would be terrible. Um, and we'd need to update our vaccines. Um, you know, good news is Moderna and I think Pfizer, although I haven't seen their data, have already made a beta vaccine and it works great. Um, so, you know, if beta came back, we're ready to go. They've already done, it's already in people. I mean, and in animals and it looks great. 
So that's the nice thing about these platforms too, is they're pretty plug and play. A new variant comes along. As soon as a new variant comes along, they're already putting it in just in case we need it. And, and just out of, of, of curiosity, why only a lab in Germany and a lab in Boston were able to make an mRNA vaccine if mRNA vaccines are so uh, so efficient, right? especially China. I mean, China was was boasting about its biotech. Uh, why why only two labs in the world managed to do it? Well, two two labs, but I mean, not just labs. Two companies throwing their ideas behind it. So, I mean, as I alluded to, the the idea. I mean, this is going to be. You know, a Nobel Prize, right? The the whole um, the this idea that you could actually make an RNA vaccine was poo pooed for many years by conventional science, right? They're like, our viral vectors are better. You can't do it. You'll never get good delivery. You'll never. Um, so you know, it took some out of the box thinkers um, to be willing to run with this idea and. You know, the reality is Moderna has been around a long time and had yet to prove that they could do it until now, right? Like one could argue were it not for the pandemic, they would have been out of business. Um, Good point. And, and BioNTech, you know, also subsidized by the German company, German government, um, out of the box thinkers, believing in their idea and sticking with it. So, I mean, it just took people willing to not listen to conventional speak that you can't disrupt the vaccine world. And, you know, Pfizer just came along to, to help with commercialization. They're awesome at that. But the ideas were from the Germans, right? <coughs> um, who aren't actually German, they're Turkish immigrants, but whatever. <laughs> but now German citizens. Yes. Um, yeah, <clears throat> no, coming to treatments, um, now, we're all familiar with antibiotics uh, to kill bacteria, but we're not very familiar with the word antiviral. Why there are so few antiviral treatments, medicines, pills? That's a really great question. The reason it's harder to make an antiviral is that viruses aren't free living beings. They rely entirely on the host machinery to make more of themselves. So they're, they're total parasites. But as a result, since they're using our own cellular machinery, it's hard to come up with ways to stop them without being toxic to our own cells. And you know that's different from a bacteria because bacteria have some unique metabolism things that they do that we don't do. So you can take an antibiotic that blocks a certain synthetic pathway that only bacteria do. And it'll stop that bacteria in its tracks, but it won't affect our cells. It's, it's very hard to do the same thing with, with a virus when every enzyme it uses is our enzyme um, to a certain extent, um, not exclusively because they do package and code for some of their own stuff. So you have to target very clearly host pathogen interactions or come up with ways to trick their, the few, I mean, the only enzymes they really code for themselves as variable by virus are the ways they replicate themselves. So what you do is you try and trick them to incorporate something bad when they're replicating themselves to stop them. Um, or if they need a specific way to cleave their proteins, you try to trick that thing. But the problem is the overlap between their enzymes that do this and our enzymes that do this is pretty close. So it's hard to find a drug with a good toxicity profile. Have you heard of anything promising in terms of antiviral? Yeah, COVID? I mean, absolutely. I mean, I think everyone knows about remdesivir, which is the only one we have um, that's licensed at the moment. Um, and it's basically one of the tricksters. It tricks the way the virus replicates and tries to get it to insert something that, that stops replication. Um, there's another drug like that um, that, uh, oops, is it Merck's? I should know this. Uh, there's another similar drug, but orally available that um, just came out of trials. And I think FDA is gonna review it next week. 
Um, and if that gets approved, we will have the first oral antiviral for COVID, which would be huge because remdesivir is only IV. It, it, it doesn't have the best toxicity profile either. It's that ratio between where it affects the virus and it affects us is not as ideal. So this, this new drug, um, Molnupiravir, I can't, I can't quite remember, is good. Um, and then Pfizer has a protease inhibitor that attacks the way it cleaves proteins that is showing promise. And um, there are lots of other approaches being tested in a million labs around the country. But I think in terms of coming to market, um, this new um, um, antiviral that I, I suspect will get approved next week, honestly, um, which will be great. And I suspect um, the protease inhibitor from Pfizer is only a few months behind. Okay, great. I finished my question. So you want, you want to say something, some conclusion or tell us uh, where you see the world going from, uh, from here? What, uh, it sounds like mostly we had good news this year, actually. So sorry for all the people who died and everything, but we got the vaccine. Uh, the vaccines are very efficient. There were doubts about the these vaccines. Um, so we have some treatment, hospitalization is down, um, some good news. Where do we go from here? Well, I think, I mean, it's lots of good news, but it's inequitable good news. And I think um, what we really need to recognize, which has been said over and over, is that, you know, no one is safe until everyone is safe. And I think that we need to turn our attention to getting equitable vaccine delivery throughout the world to places like Africa, South America, and every place else where it's really lagging because it's not helping. I mean, for me, it's just an ethical issue. I've done research in Africa for, for many years. Um, we need to help them and protect them. And by doing so, if you need this motivation, we're protecting ourselves because we're decreasing the number of new variants that are being generated. Um, so I, I think that is the single most important thing we can do. And one of the big concerns is that there's so much vaccine hesitancy in North America and Europe that I would hate to see that inhibit the delivery efforts in places that really need it right now. And it's, you know, that is a very complicated issue in terms of how we can overcome the vaccine hesitancy. But I would argue that everyone should look at what's happening in the Bay Area right now where we're doing great because we have 90% vaccinated. Yeah. And, you know, our hospitalized patients are 100% the rare unvaccinated or transfers from places where people are less vaccinated. I mean, it will keep people healthy and I would love to see more of it delivered. And I do think we're gonna come up with a lot of new antivirals in the next couple of years that will help in those cases for people who can't get vaccinated or can't mount in a good immune response because they're immunosuppressed. Um, and as I said earlier, just to end on a hopeful note, again, I hope that the era of sharing data and sharing advances for the common good lives well beyond this pandemic. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, that's, uh, that's uh, really the, the concern is that as this virus keeps spreading, we get another variant uh, that will be hard to tackle and then, uh, and then we might be in trouble again. It, it could happen, I, you know, I, it's amazing what we did in a year to get the current vaccines and we can be even faster with the variants. So I'm not as pessimistic as I could be about the new variants. Also, it's important to keep in mind that, that there's a fitness landscape that each virus can explore. And in general, you know, what we've seen is that beta is arguably the scariest, but it is arguably less fit for transmission than Delta, right? Because, I mean, we did that experiment. It happened in, in South Africa, Delta one. Um, and we don't know for sure because we need to do the lab work, which is one thing we're doing in my lab is actually set up the competitions and understand that. But it, 
it's likely that those same mutations that allowed it to escape are also slightly inhibiting of its fitness and transmission. And so I hope that we can stay on the right side of that fitness landscape while there's this lag of delivering the vaccines. Wonderful. Thank you very much. This was very informative, very helpful, and also hopeful. I like the positive message there. Thank you very much. Uh, have a good evening. Thank you. You too.